free to live faith. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord, every day. Galatians 6, he's been faithful through our study, faithful through our little time here, and now we, we finish our last message out of Galatians, and we're in chapter number 6. We're going to be in verses 11 through 18 and finish things up after we had just a tremendous time last week in BBSC celebration. Uh, that was just a sweet time of hearing what the Lord did, and... Uh, he does move and he does work, and even through the words of that song, great is your faithfulness, Lord God. Thank you uh, for being so faithful, God's people and God's family, to the work that he's called us to do. And uh, we just, uh, at the end of first service, we had a little bit of, uh, went a little bit uh, extra time because we were praying over a team of uh, six people, five of them were here this morning, that um, are headed off to Honduras the end of this week, they'll be there for a week doing some evangelism, some street work in Honduras with a uh, church plant through Good News and Action and uh, Vida Nueva. And uh, we're thrilled that we can be part of the work down there that we've been part of for many, many years. If you look up on the banners from our Acts 1A conference, you'll see that we support missionaries, Guatemala and in Nicaragua, Costa Rica, El Salvador, on and on, Steve Kern, Julio Contreras. We've been partnering with that work for uh, 23 years, I believe, 24 since the church was started. And so Honduras, a new church plant through that work, uh, six, uh, no gosh, only a couple years ago, and there are six people going. So we prayed over them, and we're praying for God's faithfulness in the lives of all of them as we had our regional mission just a few weeks ago in BBSC, and of course, we continue to press on with what God's called us to do, and, and just as Paul the Apostle did as well. Uh, when we enter into the last part of this uh, Galatians letter, the epistle to the churches at Galatia, we're reminded of how stern Paul is and how, um, how strong he is with his words, and you're even going to see a phrase uh, in our, in our uh, text today, verse number 11, of how he says, you see how large a letter I wrote to you. And some would say, oh, it's because he wrote it in large letters, uh, and it's possible that he wrote it in bigger print because of his blindness. And, of course, that was a debilitating piece of Paul's life, the, the thorn that could be, uh, it could be said that that's the thorn of his flesh. But Paul says, I wrote you a large letter. I wrote a lot to you. And uh, these last few verses, you'll, you'll see why. Paul is saying, look, church, there are some things that you're going to face and things that you need to shore up, the purpose of the church and some areas in which the church needs to really grab a hold of some things. You got saved by Jesus Christ. The, the church was planted by Jesus Christ. I'm apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. But of course, his warnings and his challenges from the very, very beginning of this letter tell you that there are things that are going to get in the way, and there's things that have gone in your way. There's things that have gotten in our way corporately and collectively as a church, and in terms of following through and finishing out uh, the mission that God's called us to, and that's until God says no more, and we continue on the mission that we have been called to, just like the churches of Galatia, and again, we'll see how Paul finishes very, very strong in this letter Let's not forget when we look at the artwork, we see that theme verse, Galatians 2, verse 20. We're reminded, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I hope you've memorized that verse. I hope that uh, it is one of those verses that you have found to be very, very important in your area of meditation, thinking on the Word of God, and of course, communing with the Lord in your worship and the Word, and saying, you know what? I need to be reminded to live faith. I need to live my life out by the faith of the Son of God. And when you see what he said in that verse, you're reminded again of how important it is to live faith. And that's what we've been doing in this study, study is pointed to, for by grace are ye saved through faith, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You're wrestling with your salvation. You're re wrestling with your belief in what the Lord has done or not done. Maybe you're lost today. You've never 
called in the name of the Lord to save you, you've never placed your faith and trust in the one who is faithful, then of course, a lot of this can only make so much sense. Yes, the Spirit of God is going to teach you some things, but it'll reprove you, and it'll keep on getting into those inner pieces and parts of you as a lost person. But truly, until you turn away from your own flesh, your own works, your sin, and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and you call upon the name of the Lord to save you, you understand that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Save is a Bible word. And again, coming to the end of yourself, that's what happened with Saul on the road to Damascus, who then God later turned into Paul, and he became a follower of Jesus Christ. And so now as he writes this letter to the church at Galatia, the churches of Galatia, he's speaking to them about their faith since they were saved. And of course, believers, followers of Jesus Christ, the question is, do you remember some of the things that God has taught you, not just through the study, but through the last two, three, four, five, six, seven years? Maybe you've been in a discipleship relationship. Maybe someone has discipled you and taught you the word of God and taught you how to walk with the Lord. But now your faith is a little weaker. Your faith is a little bit, you know, uh, sinking sand. Maybe you've got to a place where you've just gone, ah, I don't know if I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. Well, maybe today by just going through a message that you're going to hear for 40, 45 minutes and going through, hey, we're going to take the Lord's Supper and partake in that. You go, wait a minute. I remember what God did for me through the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to examine my heart and examine my place where I'm at in the Lord and go, wow. I need to turn some things around. I need to live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. I need to take heed of what Paul the Apostle is writing here. I need to take heed of what the Holy Spirit of God is showing me and telling me. And then, maybe, just maybe, I can get those steps going again with the Lord. And the Lord's going to take me, and he's going to walk with me, and he's going to be there. In fact, you are in the Lord, and Jesus Christ is your Savior and your Lord, and you're going, okay, you know what? I know that you've always had me. The Bible teaches I'm in you, you are in me. That's the truth of it all. And I need to live by the faith of the Son of God. I'm crucified with Christ, as the scriptures teach us today. Quick reminders, quick ones, a few of them here. Galatians chapter number one, here's a quick highlight. It says up there in verse number six, I marvel that you are soon so removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. That's Chapter number one, verse six, verse seven, when you look at that very first message or two, we're reminded of Paul coming right out of the chute and saying, hey, you're born again by Christ. I said it earlier. This church was planted on Jesus Christ. These churches are truly centered on the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I marvel that you are so easily removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ. How is it that I was just here not that long ago just a few years ago, this church was planted, and all of a sudden, you're troubled, you're bewitched, you're hindered. Hey, church, come on. Do I persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men, Paul asked. For if I please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. We need to serve the living Christ. We need to look at where we are at as a church and constantly look at ourselves personally and say, you know what, Lord? It is the cross that changed my life. It is the resurrection, the gospel of Jesus Christ. I need to stay right there. Then, of course, we went to chapter number two, and here's just a quick reminder. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, verse number 16 of chapter number two, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. Remember, it's by the faith of Christ. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Remember when we looked at that and, and Paul the apostle said, look, 14 after, years after I went again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, I went up by revelation and communicated unto the gospel that I preached unto the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run and had run in vain. He says, look, 
We preached to you. You believed on it. Now why are you going back? Why are you going back to try and find some way of pleasing the Lord through obeying the law, being circumcised, not talking to any of those Gentiles, and not eating of their, their food, and going back to the Levitical law? That's not what I instructed you. That's not what the Lord has for you in the new covenant you and I understanding the truth of that statement is saying, you know what? We're justified by the faith of Christ, not by the works of the law. The battle between the law and the, wor the works of the law and the faith of Jesus Christ. And then we went into chapter number three, verse number one, right out there again. Oh, foolish Galatians. Oh, foolish believers of today. Oh, foolish First Bible Baptist Church. We don't want to be called that. You're part of a church that teaches the word of God at every junction, and every corner. If you're not learning from this ministry, from someone teaching you the Bible in a group setting, a one-on-one, two-on-two setting, then that, pot, of course, we'll, we will take our part of the responsibility. But it's a good chance that you've decided that you don't want to learn. And you might become that foolish Galatian person who is bewitched by truth that, excuse me, falsehoods instead of knowing what the truth of God says. It says that ye should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. Do you remember when you got saved? Do you remember as Jesus Christ has saved you? Do you remember believing on the name of the Son of God? Do you believe that? Do you remember that? Well then who bewitched you? Oh you got away from the truth for a year or two. And it doesn't even take that long. Stop reading the word of God for 30 days. You will believe anything. You will be witched. You will be troubled. You will be hindered. Don't forget, those old foolish Galatians, they're not the ones that are the only ones that are foolish and being hindered or bewitched. It's us as well that can have that happen to us. And then Galatians chapter number four, we were in there. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son and the son, than an heir of God through Christ. Let's be reminded of who we are in Jesus. We are crying out to Abba, Father. And when it says in Galatians chapter number 4, verse number 7, what you see up on the screen, the verse right before that says, and because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. You are no longer the servant, but a son. The servant was regarded in the home of the Jew as being someone that could only raise up to a certain place, and that was it, they'd always be a servant. But the principle that they're being taught there, look, in Jesus Christ, you are not regarded just as a servant in the lineage or hierarchy of the family. You are a son, and you are part of the son of God's heirship as a son of God. What an important principle. That's how you have your identity. Your identity is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not lose track of that. Do not lose track of who you are in Jesus Christ. And it's so easy to lose track when you don't read the Word of God because that's who he's speaking to. He's speaking to you through the Lord Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, the words of life. These are words of life. And then we went into chapter number five. Now, I highlighted three or four of these. Now, because chapter five, we just went through that. There's so much there. Remember verse number one, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free and be not entangled again. With the yoke of bondage, the yoke of bondage of sin, the yoke of bondage of fulfilling the law. Don't be entangled with that. Hindered, bewitched, troubled, entangled. Oh, why would a believer go back to that? Because guess what? We like to take the path of least resistance. And maybe I can put on some airs of obeying a couple of rules and regulations. Or maybe I can show some righteousness to God of me just kind of doing a few good things. And people will notice me. And they'll see me. And they'll go, oh, you're such a good Christian. I saw that you wore the perfect outfit to church. I saw you, you were carrying your Bible. The issue is whether you were carrying it properly. You can carry it like this. You can carry it like this. But if you really love Jesus, you'll carry it close to your heart. <laughs> and now we've got this yoke of bondage wrapped around us. We're doing things that would possibly be headed toward the place of law-abiding citizenship when God is telling us through Jesus Christ, 
you're an heir. You are an heir of me and the Son of God as as a joint heir with the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't stand in that yoke of bondage where you fall. Stand fast in the liberty where Christ has made you free. Also, verse number 13 is there. For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. We looked at that in Galatians 6, the first few verses two weeks ago. One another, to love one another, to serve one another, to bear one another's burdens. On and on it goes. We are called unto liberty in salvation. And it's a beautiful thing because God says, I want you to be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ through my word, through the spirit of God, which goes into Galatians 5, verses 16 and 25, which we covered a few weeks ago. This I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Now you do know that most of all these verses are only written for pastors, right? See, they're only applied to pastors and church leaders and deacons and things like that. All of you, yeah. No, all believers. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. You're born again. You're a new creature in Christ. You say then, you walk in the Spirit. Hey, this I say then, walk in the Spirit. Don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Have you figured out how lustful your flesh is? The word means strong desire, period. You can lust for anything. Don't forget in that passage it talks of how the Spirit lusts for us. The Holy Spirit has a strong desire for you and for me. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. You say, oh, this is the last five chapters, and gosh, I just stopped going backwards and reviewing things. Just let's move over and move on. Okay, we will. Verse number 14 of chapter number 6. This is our highlight verse. Because it gets so much easier as we go on. No, I told you it's going to get tough here at the end. Paul's a great finisher. He's a great closer. He closes this deal pretty well here in this letter. And that's why he says, I've written you a large letter in these last verses. He could be done by saying, grace be unto you, peace, and the Lord Jesus Christ, and be done. He does do that in verse 18, but... He adds a few verses here, and one of them is this. And this is our centerpiece for today. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Don't let that sneak by you. The Bible's telling you that in Christ, I'm crucified with Christ, Nevertheless, I live. We've talked about that. You, you're born again, and when you're born again, you're crucified with Christ. You're in Christ. He is in you. Bible, doctrine, and theology, right on the money. Plenty of verses to tell you that. Bible tells me as I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless, I live. And it also tells me up there, Saving the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ that I will glory in. Because Paul's saying, I, God forbid that I would glory in anything else but the cross. He says, the world is crucified unto me. Does that mean you walk out and you don't go into the world anymore? No, you have to live in this world. You're supposed to go into the world and teach all nations, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. When you go outside of this room, you, go, you leave up there. There's an Acts 1-8 statement up there. You shall receive power. You will be my witnesses. And you go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part. That is your call, believer. It's your assignment. It's your command. It's your commission. And the world is crucified unto you. Because you're in Christ, so it's crucified unto him. In Christ. No effect. Unless you want it to be. You give permission to God or you give permission to the world. You give permission to God or you give permission to yourself. But he's telling me I took care of it at the cross. And the death and burial resurrection of me, Jesus Christ, you are crucified with me. That's why Paul says I would not glory in anything but the cross. 
He says very simply what you and I need to get a handle on. And it says up there very, very clearly that Paul's got a conclusion for these Galatian people. You can go one way or the other, but it's bondage or liberty, it's flesh or spirit, or it's self or others. Paul's conclusion is bam, right again in your face. Bam, right in my face. This is not just dancing. Now, you can, you can close the Bible right now if you want. You can I joke a little bit. I say this, you take a black sharpie right now and just draw a line through a bunch of verses. But it's not going anywhere because it's still there. And Paul's saying, bondage your liberty, your call, glory in yourself, glory in the law, glory in the bondage of the law, bondage of sin. You can have flesh that you can live on or you can live by the Holy Spirit. You can say, okay, self-pleasures or others' pleasures. You really think that pleasing yourself is a great way for peace? Nope. You really think that pleasing yourself is going to give you more of the filling of the Holy Spirit? Nope. You really think that going contrary to the Word of God, every one of us that's tried that, how has that turned out? Because Jesus' conviction for the church is this. You're going to either choose circumcision legalism, or the cross. Do you hide behind some perfect certain work that you do? Like Peter told them, you need to get circumcised. The Judaizers get circumcised. Then you'll be better off and follow the law. No, there's, there's things in the word of God. If you just submit yourself to the word of God, there's plenty of things that you can follow. I heard there's a bunch of commands in the Bible. But why are you going to follow them and what kind of hard attitude? Is it law or grace? Is it grace? I'm saved by grace. I ought to live by grace. I'm saved by faith. I ought to live by faith. Is it works or faith that I'm going to make my relationship more justified with God? It's faith that makes you in God's eyes justified and then your righteousness as his filthy rags is thrown out the door and he says it's faith now the works after that they're really important to excuse me to the Lord yes and that's where faith and works works that's what James teaches us in so many other places in the word of God but it's not works to justify yourself it's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ we glory in the cross. That's who we glory in. You say, who? The one that's on the cross. We glory in the cross. For God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. My all-time favorite old hymn. When I survey the wondrous cross, on which the prince of glory died. My richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God, all the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet? or thorns composed so rich a crown. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. When I survey the wondrous cross, oh my, Would I really, really say, like Paul said, every day, I would rather glory in the cross than glory in myself. Let's read our scripture. Verse number 11, chapter number 6. There it is, that first verse. And ye see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. Remember, 
there's a lot of times that he has somebody else write the Bible, write the scripture for him. He says, I wrote this with my own hand, which again lends again to people thinking, hey, he wrote big letters. He might have, just so he could see them. But he also wrote a large letter to this bunch of churches at Galatia saying, hey, I have lots to write, so here you go. Verse number 12, let me remind you of what goes on in the church when we're filled with our pride. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Hey, just do a work, do some works, get some circumcision going, do some things on the outside to keep your Walk with the, God, with the Lord just the way it ought to be. Verse number 13 is great how Paul just puts it right back on you, puts it right back on those. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. Hey, I told them how to follow God by getting circumcised. So see, I've got this whole crew of people that just really follow after me. So it's my church. It's my sect. It's my bunch. I'm of Paul. I'm of Cephas. I'm of Apollos. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What about Jesus? That's how that goes in the church sometimes. Verse 14. But God forbid, there's that highlight verse, that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. That's what Jesus is telling us. For in Christ Jesus, verse 15, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. That circumcision is just a work. It's just a flesh thing. It's a, the new creature in Christ. The circumcision avails nothing, nor not being circumcised avails nothing. It's just a new creature in Christ. It's a spiritual birth. Verse 16, as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy upon the Israel of God. From henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's the, there's the closing statement. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Okay, you could have just said that, Paul. You didn't have to get so tough over there. You see, it is said that this old hymn might be the most favorite of all when you think about the cross on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross with the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. Do you know that one? Is that one of your favorites? So here we go. You have to join me. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange a Sunday for a crown. Okay, I should go out there and you should come up here. You sound so much better. It's the old rugged cross, so it's despised by the world. Has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it at dark Calvary. Amen. To that old rugged cross I will ever be true its shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me one day, someday to my home far away, where his glory forever I'll share. You see, that's glorying in the cross. That's for us to glory in the cross. You see, church, just in outlining this for a few moments, then I'll make some quick application. You have to realize in those first two or three verses there, verses 11, 12, and 13, that in our church's purpose, in the way that we look at what our purpose ought to be, something comes welling up here, and that's our pride. Again, verse number 12 tells you that, doesn't it? Hey, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you. They say, you must do this, and you must do this, and you must do this. They are the ones that want to stand out in front and be the arrogant person that knows everything about everything and tells you how to walk with the Lord. They tell you how to live faith. Instead of teaching you from the word of God, from being a vessel in disciple making, where they say, hey, 
I know that I can show you some stuff, but I'm going to point you to Jesus Christ. That's who I'm going to point you to. I'm going to point you to the cross. God forbid that I would glory in myself. I want to glory in the cross. And those are the people that we need to follow after. Those that are compromising or they're hypocrite. They tell you to do something and then they don't do it themselves. You say, wait a minute. Is that something he's dealing with? Yeah, he says in verse number 13, for neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law. <laughs> they tell you to do it, but they don't do it themselves. Because you can't keep the law. If you want to go to keep the law, go ahead and try it. Give it a shot. And when you come up short, you let me know how it goes. Because Jesus Christ fulfilled all the law. And in Christ you're crucified. Nevertheless you live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live, the life, the life, the life that I now live, live faith. Paul says, look, in verse number 14 and 15, there's something that's really somehow convoluted and turned around and mixed up. And that's what our church's real purpose is. It gets, it gets misunderstood sometimes. Look at verse 14. Right in the middle of the verse, Lord Jesus Christ. In the beginning of verse 15, for in Christ Jesus. This is Paul constantly. In verse number 12, the cross of Christ. It is about Jesus Christ. It's always centered on Jesus Christ. In sorting out our purpose as a church, we must be reminded that we can misunderstand what God's telling us and teaching us. And Paul would glory in the cross. Why? Because he knew Jesus. You glory in the cross when you know Jesus Christ. That's who you glory in. You glory in him. When you don't know him that well, you don't glory in Jesus Christ. You glory in yourself. He had a personal relationship that continued to grow. It continued to get better and better and stronger. He understood. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. He understood the power of the gospel. He understood the power of the gospel, excuse me, of the cross, as it says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Jesus Christ was everything to Paul, and he gloried in the cross because he understood the purpose of the cross. Do you understand the purpose of the cross, or have you just thought, okay, that's a nice piece of jewelry I'm going to hang. That's really nice. No, 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 no. If you have a nice cross, just don't throw it away. It's okay. But that's an awful lot shinier than the cross of Jesus Christ. You and I couldn't carry that cross around. That's why if any man will come after me. Let him deny himself and take up Jesus' cross daily. That's not what he said. He said, take up his cross daily if any man will come after me. The thing is, in Jesus Christ, you are crucified. And so you don't have to bear his cross. What you need to do is very simply give glory to him and allow your life to glory in the cross. The blood that was shed. He says there in verses number 16, 17, and 18, to finish it out, he reminds us in 16, as many as walk according to this rule. What rule? The rule for the Galatians to walk in the liberty. Stand therefore. Stand, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free. It says there, and he continues, peace be on them, the Galatian people that are walking in the liberty of Christ. And he says, grace, peace, excuse me, and mercy and upon the Israel of God. Oh, that's some special bunch of people. No, no, no. That is him relating to, as he says very clearly, those that walk according to this rule is the rule of the Galatians, Jew. Scythian, barbarian, Gentile, Greek, all of you in Jesus Christ, when you're born again in Jesus Christ, walk according to this rule. What rule? That you're free in Christ. Who bewitched you? But those who walk by the Holy Spirit of God have desired to not, not be in a place where you're going to walk by the law. So put down the law. Why does he use that terminology? I'd have to believe this. You put off the old man. Who is the old man? Jacob. Is he not the old man? Well, I know I'm the old man. I tell that my grandchildren. They call me old man. Listen, the old man is Jacob, but the new man is Israel. Put on the new man. 
and walk in the liberty of the Lord Jesus Christ. It ties right together to those that are to walk according to this rule. The liberty in Christ. It goes back to verse 14, verse number 15. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word of God is not that confusing unless you want to add some junk to it to destroy it and take away the glory from God. Simply put again, these are those who trusted Christ as Savior. And he says in verse number 17 and 18, just in case you wondered, hey, before I say grace be unto you and glory to the Lord, I want to let you know that if anybody's wondering if I understand any of this, I have the marks on my body to prove it. Now maybe you don't have those marks of Paul, but maybe you have some spiritual contests you've walked through and you would say, hey, I haven't been shipwrecked. <laughs> I haven't been in danger of deaths off. I haven't had 40 stripes, five times saved one, beaten with rods three times, stoned. I haven't had that happen to me, but maybe there's been some spiritual suffering that you've gone through. And you realize in giving glory to the Lord and glorying in the cross that it goes back to that all-time favorite verse in 1 Corinthians 10. Whether therefore you eat or drink, or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. We glory in the cross. Again, glory in the cross. When you think about what it says there, it's a simple statement, but Paul's saying, but God forbid that I should glory. I fear that we glory. We glory in ourselves way too much. You say, I, you know, I, okay, good. But there are times where we can look at our lives and say, it's easy to give glory to God here in the church service when we have our Lord's Supper and I'm going to remember what he did and for me and I'm going to examine my own heart. It's good. You've got a safe place right in here. But what about when it says the world is crucified unto Jesus, so in Jesus it doesn't have you. It doesn't need to have you. Do you glory in the cross or do you glory in yourself? Do you glory in someone who's taught you? Do you glory in some great lesson that you've come up with yourself? Do you glory in your baptism? Do you glory in your servanthood, your ministry? Do you glory in your family? Paul said, hey, God forbid that I would glory. Save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me make three simple supportive statements here about how we glory in the cross. The first one's a negative because I think it's important to see this text as it is. Pretenders of Jesus Christ, they abuse the cross for manipulation and promotion of man. What do you mean? Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. I'll get there in a minute. If you want to join me, I'll have them up there in a moment. They abuse the cross for manipulation. Yeah, I'm a Christian, but I live whatever way I feel like living. Yeah, I believe in the old rugged cross. It's great. I sung that hymn once. By the way, real quick, this would be fun. The old rugged cross hymn is there anyone here that's not ever heard it? Could you raise your hand for me? Help me out a little bit. Wow. That's awesome. Have any of you never heard the hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross? Wow. Lesson over. I'm going home. <laughs> you guys know everything. It means something to you. So why would I abuse the cross for manipulation? Hey, I'm saved, I'm born again, I do what I want. I've got eternal security. I dealt with it at the cross. The Bible tells me that my sins are cast, as he says, from the west, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. The washing, regeneration, renewing the Holy Ghost. Hey, I'm born again. I'm in Christ. The cross, that's it. I'm good. Well, you know what? I'm of Paul and I'm of Cephas. I have a fellowship. I had someone that discipled me, and boy, they're the best. 
I learned everything that they taught me. And I tell you what, I understand that now. I got that, all that thing, I got that. And do we put everything in a place where it's the Bible leader, the Bible teacher, the person that we cling to? And so, glory in the cross, to me, has pretenders of Jesus Christ. Some that say that they're saved, that maybe are lost. Some that are saved, that are living in a carnal way, and so... Things are upside down in our lives. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse number 17, a reminder of the lost world who says, for Christ sent me not to baptize, Paul says, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. It says in verse number 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. And that's amen, and I thank you, God, and that's awesome. What do I do with that? Do I manipulate that and work that so it only is convenient at a certain time and then I promote other people around me or I promote the the leadership of some other man's teaching or I get on here and I do this and I do that and then I say, oh yeah, the cross, yeah, that's great. Cross has the final word. Yeah, when I say the one. And what is it about how we will not be honest with ourselves and say, wait a minute, I'm abusing the beautiful cross of the Lord Jesus Christ by glorying in things that are not of his work and his suffering. Because if I really, really want to live the life that he has for me, the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me, it says in Philippians chapter number three, Verse number 17, brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. Verse 18, caution for many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame who mind earthly things. Whew! He said that to the church at Philippi. The Holy Spirit saying the same thing to you through the word of God that he's saying to me. Very clearly, that man has a way of glorying in many, many things other than the cross and may manipulate or promote man. And that's what he was warning against in verses number 12 and 13. And then you see something else up on the screen the positive side of these, the last two. The embracers of Jesus Christ revisit the cross for remembrance and examination. That's what we're going to be doing here in a moment. We're going to take the Lord's Supper. We're going to have you come up and grab the elements and go back and sit in your seat. And I say it often, will you spend some time examining your heart? Will you spend some time remembering what Jesus Christ did for you? Do you know what he did for you? He put you in a place where when we revisit the cross, it is to remember He did all that he could do. He did everything. It's a finished work. It is finished. In Romans chapter number five, verse number one, it says, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse number two, you know the verse, many of you, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. I rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, not in my own And then he goes into this incredible list, Paul does. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience. And then we stop and go, oh my goodness, I don't want to glory in all of that. Here's a glory in the tribulations. When you remember and examine yourself and you say, I'm going to embrace what Jesus Christ has done. I'm an embracer of Jesus Christ. And God forbid, if I would glory in anything other than the cross. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter number four, it's up on the screen, for all things are for your sakes that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Would it be sweet if your whole life in the abundant grace that you're living in, that the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God that people are talking about, this is what God has done. Well, that's what we did at VBSC last week. And it redounds to the glory of God. Not to the glory of man. It says, okay, I'm a embracer of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and I revisit the cross to remind myself of what he's done for me, and I examine my soul and my heart to say, what is upon my heart that's between me and you, Lord? I need to do that. I need to continually say, okay, I'm going to stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made me free. Just a side note to you, be reminded, in Acts chapter number 12, there was a guy named Herod who stood up before the people in the midst of them trying to mess with Peter again. And here they are, and Herod stands up in front of the people, and he speaks, and he orates, and the Bible tells us that the people said, oh, he speaks as a God, as a God, or as a, of a God. And it says next that the angel of the Lord smote him and killed him right there because he took glory for himself. And you wonder why people around this world disappear that are in positions of power. You wonder if it was Almighty God saying, I've had enough. Glory in the cross. We glory in the cross one more time. Here's another positive side. Beyond being an embracer of Jesus Christ, an identifier. Do you identify with the Lord Jesus Christ? Sure I do. Sure I do. Then we should be contending for the cross with obedience and suffering. It's not just a six, eight, ten day trip off to Honduras. They're going to go through tough time. Whatever. Come on now, really, everybody, wake up. We exaggerate the tough stuff like, wow, we're really suffering. Again, have you been beaten with rods for Jesus Christ? Only those, to me, who have really suffered for the name of Jesus Christ in their place of leading really have a leg to stand on. We're to contend for the cross with obedience and suffering, whatever it may be. Whatever. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, I believe I have up on there. Verse number 15. But I have the whole passage, 9 through 15. You want to write it down in your notes. Wherefore we labor that, whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also made manifest in your consciences. It says up there, verse number 15 in that passage, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Oh, that's easy to read it Sunday. I wish, Pastor, you'd stop that, because if you read that again and read that again, yeah, it'll resonate in your soul. Born again believer, it's going to hit you. It's going to hit you who you live for. It hits me. Who am I living for? Henceforth live unto them. Selves. But the one that died for all says, Henceforth you do not live for yourself, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Who do you live for? Because if you contend for the cross, it's obedience and suffering. It says up there in 2 Corinthians chapter number 11, I just grabbed a tidbit of this, verses 18 through 33. You know, I mentioned them a few just a minute ago. You know what's in 18 through 33? Paul labored more abundant, received stripes above measure, was in prisons more frequently, in danger of deaths off, received 40 stripes, five times saved one, was beaten with rods, three times stoned, shipwrecked. You know? Oh, I've heard that. Yeah, just hard for me to believe it. Hard for you to believe it. He apparels a lot, robbers, my own, I mean, gosh, my own countrymen. And it says in verse number 30, if I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities. Why do we want to run from the infirmities that come with suffering and obedience unto the cross? Because henceforth we live unto ourselves instead of living unto him. We're not to live. I'm not to live to myself. That's a nice song you read, Pastor. This old rugged cross is good memories when I survey the wondrous cross. Did we read that a few minutes ago? Yeah, oh, I, I forgot that. Uh, what did you say? On which the prince of glory died. My riches gain, I count but loss. On a hill far away stood the old rugged cross. 
Did you just read that too? And he's going to call me one day to my home far away? What physical marks do we bear for Jesus Christ? I fear that our obedience and our suffering comes as something that we have self-inflicted because we glory in ourselves rather than the cross. May that turn around in our lives, church. Because I'm telling you what, it's the only thing that's going to count in glory is our sufferings in Christ, our infirmities. You say, well, life is tough. I have a tough time. No kidding. But what sufferings, infirmities, and pains have I suffered? What marks have I suffered for the cross of Jesus Christ? It says up on the screen today, we celebrate the Lord from the cross to the crown, from his obedience on the cross to his glory in the crown. That's what we're going to do as we finish out our service this morning. Why don't you please stand and let me pray with you. And then we're going to come, come up and grab the elements for the Lord's Supper. So if you would, please stand, put your things behind you and bow your heads. Let me pray for you. And then I'll have you go down the outside aisles and come back down the middle. We took a few chairs away so you can pass well. So everybody on this side goes down here, grabs things and comes up the middle, over here, down here, and goes up to your seat in the middle. Our Father in heaven, this is a beautiful time, but it's only made beautiful because of the pain and suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. Thank you for that old rugged cross, Jesus, but thank you for the resurrection, Jesus. And thank you for eternity one day. Now, God, as a church, we don't want to glory in anything, not in anything as a pretender about man manipulate this beautiful, beautiful cross. No, we want to glory in the cross of the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. So as we take time to celebrate who you are and what you are to us, in our lives as a church and individually, I pray that you would just work in our hearts as we remember and examine in our Lord's Supper. In Jesus' name, amen.